Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Rowski, and I'll be your host for today. We have an action-packed event today. Uh, the Ooster Scale Day has now made its way to Conception, so still making its way along the coast of Chile. Uh, and today, in fact, is an exciting day because the new Darwin leaders will be joining the ship soon, about to head out onto conservation projects around the area to make incredible videos, discoveries, uh, learning, and then share that all with us. So I always like to share my screen here at the beginning to get a feel for where we are now. Let me make this a little bit bigger. There we go. So I like this view here of the world. We've got South America down here, the southernmost tip, and you can see how we've made our way all along the coast of South America, Brazil, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, into Chile, and you can see the last week or so we've made our way through the fjords uh, of Chile. If you click on some of the little image bubbles here, you can see what the ship has been up to. There's a beautiful view uh, in front of a glacier. So a few little views here of what people have been up to. And here you can see the ship has made its way uh, to Concepcion. So one of the favorite things that we've shared so far last week in a world's most exciting classroom event was a really cool video of some blue whales. So I'm gonna share that again this week because I think it is such a great video. And for those who didn't see it last week, uh, it is definitely worth checking out. So let me share my screen here uh, and we'll take a look at this little video clip. Uh, where did it go? There it is. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look. So you can see here, we've got the Ooster Scalde there. And then uh, as they were making their way out towards a little bit of open water, that's when they started to see whales. So here we go. We've got blue whales, the largest things to ever live on our planet. That would have been absolutely amazing to see them uh, close to the ship. You could see with the drone there from one of our amazing camera operators that they weren't that far from the ship. So there we go. Beautiful, massive blue whales. We learned from Stu last week, hunted almost to the point of extinction. But since whales have been protected around the world, their population, especially in the Southern Oceans, have made a great comeback. And then there's a tiny little clip here as we wrap up. They saw some other whale species. There were some say whales, uh, and then they saw these humpback whales. So all in the span of a very short period of time, they saw three amazing whale species. All right. So something that we'd like to do over the next couple of weeks is share some more stories from our Darwin leaders. So we've got stories coming up from places like Uruguay and Brazil, uh, places like Argentina and Chile. And to start us off today, uh, we have Sehi joining us. She is on the ship right now. So I'm going to bring her in from backstage. Hey, Sehi, how are you? Hi, I'm doing good. How are you, Joe? All right. It's good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. All right. So first of all, were you on the ship sailing this yeah. way or did you just join? Yeah. So I was able to see all the blue whales, the humpback whales, and it was such an incredible sight. I think magical is the only way, the only word to describe such a scene. Magical. I, I, I can imagine that. I think that's a pretty apt term to use. What about going through the fjords? What was that like? It was nothing like I had actually expected. It was just we were just cruising so like calmly through the very calm waters you see volcanoes like covered with snow you see volcanoes i mean sorry um glaciers on the side and it was just i didn't know such a site on earth existed yet alone to think that i would have a chance to experience it myself and see it for myself it was incredible all right so just to those who are tuning in you do hear some noise in the background and that's just the ship uh, they're getting ready for the new Darwin leaders to come on board uh, in a few hours. So I imagine it is just a beehive of activity right now, Sahi. Yeah, absolutely. We're making sure the ship is in tip-top shape before the Darwin leaders arrive. We have very cool projects coming up. We have a project about sea otters and a project about dolphins. And we're really excited to start filming them. All right. So you've had that experience. You have been in the shoes of a Darwin leader. Where was it? And can you tell us a little bit about what it was like for you? Oh yeah, sure. Um, my project was in a uh, in a region called um, Punta Arenas. That's the port that the ship was in, and then the actual project was in the national park of Torres del Paine. It's about a three hour drive away from Punta Arenas. So um, we were based on the ship uh, in Punta Arenas. Took a bus to Torres del Paine National Park, and then filmed for about three days, very intensively, going to the park. Um, actually, I got the chance to live 
or like stay inside the national park on um on one of the places that the the park rangers actually live in so that means i got the best views when all the tourists are gone and i got to live i got to stay like right next to the visitor center with all the park rangers with the views of the of the massif right in front and um yeah i felt like it was such a such a special experience um and the species that I particularly focused on was a species, should I reveal it now? Or yeah, I guess I could talk about it. It's a species called the huemul. Um, it's an endemic species of deer that only lives in this very specific region. Um, and so I look forward to sharing this video with you and to, to share what this experience was like. Excellent. And before we do play the, the video, there's two things I want to talk about today. Sure. Uh, one is just to kind of set the scene. These these are pretty endangered, aren't they? Oh, yeah. There's um, the exact number is unknown because they're really, really rare to see. Actually, not many people get the privilege of seeing them. Uh, I'd say there's about 1,500 left in the world, um, just over 1,000 in Chile and 500 in Argentina. But there's just like there is a very specific region that these um, species of deer live in. So it's not, uh, they're, they're very, very endangered, but not many people know about it because there's so few left in the world. All right. And to those who are tuning in, uh, we have a great six class joining us via audio and they're gonna ask some questions shortly. Uh, but those tuning in, use the YouTube chat sidebar. Of course, let us know where you're tuning in from. And then as you watch this video, the first in the series of three, um, if you have any questions, put them into the comment section for us in the live chat, uh, and we'll answer some of those shortly. But what do you say, Sehi? Let's jump into this video. Let's do it. All right. How do we conserve something we don't even see? Torres del Paine, the eighth wonder of the world. They say it's a magical place, and I was lucky enough to experience it for myself. Let me introduce you to the characters of my story. That's Fiorella, who wears her flamingo earrings, and she's one of those people who knows every bird and plant species around you. Oh, that's Jorge, who blasts 90s rock music in the car and is totally a badass in every way. That's Barbara, who's an expert sandwich maker, always cracking me up with her contagious energy. Oh, and that's me not knowing what adventure was ahead. I think this is the, one of the most beautiful things I've seen in my life, but also the most windiest places I've ever been. <laughs> I'd say the first thing I noticed about Torres del Paine is that it's windy. It's very, very windy. And then I think the second thing I noticed is that it rains pretty much every day. <laughs> and you might think that's a bad thing, but it actually means that you could see rainbows every single day, which is pretty cool. This magical place is filled with berries and tender flowers that fight against the 100 km per hour wind every day. And you're just so amazed because, I mean, I have so much trouble just standing up straight myself. I don't know how the flowers are doing it. It's also home to gauchos, an integral part of Patagonian culture. Um, I think on the first day, Jorge told me that if you look carefully, you could see the silhouette of a gaucho riding a horse on the peaks of the national park. But only if you have a herd, a gaucho herd, you would see it. <laughs> it's right now. <laughs> and honestly, I don't think I saw it until the second day. It took me many, many squints to finally see it. But most importantly, this place is home to the critically endangered species called the Huemu. It's on the Chilean coat of arms, although the species itself is not very well known. 
During my time in Torres del Paine, Fiorella, Jorge, and Barbara taught me all about them. I think I remember Barbara describing it to me as like a magical guardian animal of Patagonia, and that tells you how special it is. Que que es un animal que como que te te da como cuando lo ves como que te parece como que te da ternura. And they are also a very mystical animal because they are they are dears but they are not especially afraid of people. They say that when you finally get to see it, you feel like you're part of it and it's a part of you as well. I don't know, does that, does that make sense to you? <laughs> the Humul is an animal who uh, give you a lot of calm and, and silent because to observe it, you have to be in silent and, and so don't move fast so that you don't scare the animal. Calma, para mí los huemules me llevan a eso, como tranquilidad y, y, y emoción, amor, como son animales pasivos, como, eh, hermosos. The first thing I learned about the huemul was that there's only 1,500 left in Chile and just under 2,000 left in the world, um, which is pretty devastating. And if you think about it, I think it's easier to see a polar bear than it is to see a huemul. We don't even get to see huemul because there's so few left in the world. And that thought posed a question in my head which kept coming back to me over and over again, which is how do you conserve something that you don't even see? And they just kind of a funny picture for the huemul. It's just, there's like thousands of other better pictures. Maybe this is why there's low awareness about it. <laughs> they say it used to be very easy to see huemul in the wild, but certainly not anymore. Their biggest threat, it's not the puma, which supposedly is the only natural predator of huemul. Instead, there is a new vicious, ruthless animal by the thousands, driving the huemul to the brink of extinction. It's cows. Yeah, cows. Thousands and thousands of them inside the national park. Isn't that crazy? To see this change for myself, I headed to a region called Pingo. The ranger in charge of Pingo is Jose. He also goes by Wayaha. He is one of few rangers left in the park who can actually ride a horse. He has a bit of nostalgia for the past. He was like huemul, but in human form. He is so agile and fast on the trails. I was always running to catch up to him. <laughs> este parque para mí significa mucho. Eh, para mí fue toda mi vida. Me crecí. Aprendí a trabajar acá en el parque, guardaparque. Oh yeah, another thing is that Wayaha hates cows. Well, he pretty much despises the cows. Right. Let's get you back in here, Say, What a great start. Uh, and I can see that Jorge probably inspired some of the music you had in the background. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, this was just the, the first out of three episodes. So in the coming days, we'll continue this search for cows that we started. Um, we have some exciting films coming up that talks about how we find these cows, how do we track them down, and what kind of damage are they actually doing here in this particular film that you guys saw, it was a, a sneak preview of, of the interplay between cows and the huemul, but you can imagine it's not, a, not such a pretty sight. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there's a question that came in on the chat already, wondering, 
why that the cows are allowed to graze in the national park? Are they allowed to, or are, are farmers just doing it? Ranchers just doing it? That is an excellent, excellent question. And that, that was basically the primary question that I was investigating. So technically, the cows are not allowed to be in the national park. You can imagine the national parks around your home country. You would not you would be surprised to find domestic cows um, grazing inside the national park. They don't belong there. But it's really easy to see the cows there because um, actually it, it has some historical reasons because the national park used to be surrounded and is still surrounded by um, different ranches that has been practicing these grazing techniques for generations and generations. And in the past, they would just let go of the cows in the national park and they would graze for free. So for the farmers, it's just free grass that they can use to um, keep up with their with their cows. But now it's a protected area. People are more aware that we need to protect this area. We need to be aware of what kind of animals we're introducing to the ecosystem. But in fact, the neighboring ranches and the farms that are nearby are still practicing the same um, same techniques that they've been using for generations due to many reasons, cultural reasons, uh, lack of communication lack of trust between the park and the and the farmers so it, there's a there's a whole myriad of reasons all right we have some grade sixes in linwood ontario hanging out backstage they're joining us via audio today how are we doing grade sixes how are we doing guys Good. all right i can see a question in the chat already but let's let's grab a couple questions while we have you okay what questions do we have anybody have any questions so far yeah come on up Why are cows bad to the land? Sorry? Why are cows bad to the land? Or what do they do that you don't like them? Ah, oh, what do the cows do that are so bad? Yeah, that's such a good question because when you see cows, they're so they're so kind and nice. They look good and they look picturesque. So most tourists actually just take pictures. They think they're so good for the environment, but actually the kind of damage that they do is very detrimental. What they do is they eat all the food that the huemul is supposed to eat. So there are these tender leaves that only huemul can eat. The huemul doesn't eat very rough, aggressive grass. They eat young, um, young, softer trees. But then the cows, they just take over the entire region and they eat all the food that was supposed to be Huemul's food. Also, the cows um, are so big and so, um, yeah, some of them actually, this, this is actually something that surprised me. Some of them are wild cows. So what happens is that the farmers, inter uh, the farmers let go of the cows into the region, right? And then the farmers forget to bring back the cows back home. So then these cows are just wild. And you can imagine like these angry bulls that are kind of running around and it can actually be dangerous and they also are very aggressive they knock down trees because they like to like scratch their backs on a on a tree or something like that they dig holes so that they can um you know have a little bath on the dirt but this is so detrimental because it's knocking down trees it's it's destroying the habitat um young grass don't have the chance to become big trees because when they're so young the cows just eat it and then they're just gone so it was it was really shocking to see that these very um very quiet gentle animals such as cows can do such big damage that's a great question all right great six do you have one more for us we do i think we have at least one more um Levi, you right. have you seen squirrels what was the question oh ask again have you seen squirrels are there have any I seen... squirrels in the area oh squirrels I don't think I've seen squirrels when I was there. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if they actually, there's a, there's a native species of squirrel that lives in Chile. Okay. Um, we do have one more if you can take it. Of course. Okay. How big are those? I think he's asking how big, are you asking how big the herds of cows are? The birds. The birds. Oh, the birds. How big oh, are the birds there? Oh, 
Oh, there's so many different kinds of birds. There's there's big birds, small birds. Um, actually, I'm a terrible birder, so you have to be very quiet when you're um, supposed to watch the birds so that they don't fly away. But I am so terrible. I I get so excited when I see a bird. I'm like, oh, look, there's a bird, and then they just fly away. Um, but they one of the members of my team that I worked with at the park was a birder and she was able to point out um, what they were doing, the different species, and that was really cool to see. Oh, and another thing is that there's a very um, tasty berry that only grows in this area and it grows on the ground um, and the birds love it. They love it so much, but humans also love it. So what I got to do was you get to pick up the berries from the ground. It's not growing from a bush or anything. It's like on the ground and people walk on top of it. And that's surprising because the, the berries are so strong. They could be they can be walked on and they, they can still grow. So you pick the berries up, you put it in your mouth, and then you continue hiking because they, they give you so much energy. All right. Very cool. Well, grade six is stick with us because in a little bit, we're going to have our second guest join us from the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica. So uh, we'll be sure to get some of your questions then. We have someone in the Netherlands here, say he, who's curious about the park. Is there a maximum number of tourists who can enter during the day? That's a good question. I don't think there's a maximum number, but there's certainly a lot of tourists, like thousands and thousands of tourists every single day that come from all over the world. And that's actually another part of, of the conservation problems that the park faces um, because there's so many tourists and, and some of the trails that the park has were not necessarily meant to accommodate so many number of tourists. So there are these paths that are eroding and kind of destroying the natural um, vegetation. So what the organization is doing, the organization that I worked with is they're trying to make better better engineered trails. So did you know that you could actually, you need to think a lot about how to make these paths that, that go along these national parks. So how to create better engineered trails that are not as destructive, um, that keeps people off of, of, of the natural uh, native vegetation. So that was also another cool thing that I learned. All right, very cool. One more question for you, Sehi, and then we will uh, let you continue with the preparations today. Uh, any condors in the park? Do you know if there are any condors in the park? Uh, definitely. I think I've, I've seen condors. Um, definitely, definitely many. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Well, say, hey, you have an exciting day ahead of you uh, with the new leaders to welcome aboard and get out on their projects. Do you know how many there are this time? Is it five, six? Uh, there's, there's two. There's two. So it's a small group and it'll be a great chance for us to um, focus deep about these these two projects about sea otters and dolphins. Um, and we're, we're very excited to welcome them on board this afternoon. Excellent. Well, say, hey, we can't wait to see the next two videos in the series. Uh, hopefully they'll be posted on the Darwin 200 YouTube soon. Uh, but thank you so much for taking a little time today to, to hang out with us and share your Darwin Leader experience. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and for watching the, the video that I worked on really hard with me, of course. And I also have to mention the videographer that has poured his heart and soul into making this, this video with me. So we're, I'm, I'm really happy you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Sehi. We will connect again soon. But for now, have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Well, very cool. The next things that we're going to do, we have a few things to do. One uh, is that we have um, the Toucan Rescue Ranch joining us shortly. So from Costa Rica, we had them join us a few weeks ago uh, and they shared with us uh, some amazing uh, facts and knowledge and the work that they do rehabilitating native wildlife in Costa Rica. So we met the slots, some of the slots that unfortunately couldn't be returned back to the wild. So some of the resident slots. Today, we're going to do things a little different and we're going to meet some of their toucans uh, that they have at the rescue ranch, aptly named the Toucan Rescue Ranch. But before we do that, we are going to take a look at the results from last week's experiment. So last week, uh, or sorry, two weeks ago, we had an experiment uh, with candles. And what I'm going to do here is just play a little clip to remind you uh, what it looked like. So just bear with me for a moment while I bring it in here. And then we'll play a little clip so that you can see just a reminder of uh, the experiment. So here we go. And we are going to cover the candle with the glass jar. So the glass jar goes in. 
And then we're just gonna, I'm gonna try and get down here a little bit and we're gonna see what happens. So you should be able to see something happening. You see our candle went out, you see it started to float and you can see that the water level has risen by at least an inch, maybe even an inch and a half inside of this jar. So there we go, it worked out nice for us live. Your task this week is to try this at home, try this in the classroom. Again, a reminder that it does use something like a match or a barbecue lighter. Uh, so you do want to have someone help you out with that. And then try this out, take some pictures and send us your results. You wanna All right, so that was our experiment from two weeks ago, the candle. Uh, in a jar experiment. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, what happened there um, and why. So we saw a few things. First, we saw the candle lit and then we put the jar on top. Now, what that did is it cut off the oxygen supply to the candle, to the flame. Uh, they can't burn without oxygen. They need that fuel. So once we put that jar on top, that was pretty much game over for that flame. It used up the small amount of oxygen in the jar and it went out. But there were two things happening during that time. First, when the jar first went on, it heated up the glass, it heated up the air inside. So that air expanded. When air heats up, it expands and pushes. So that created more pressure. Now, air likes to be evenly balanced. It likes to have equilibrium. So with more pressure inside the jar, it pushed outwards to start to equal things out between the inside and outside of the jar. But very quickly, the flame went out. So the air in the jar started to cool down quickly, which means now instead of more pressure in the jar, there's less pressure in the jar compared to outside. So all of that air wants to equalize. So it pushes in, from the outside. And when it does that, it pushes the water in as well. So that's why we saw the water rise after the flame was extinguished. So it's all about air pressure and air pressure always wanting to have a nice balance, a nice equilibrium. So if air expands, other cooler air will rush in to fill that space. If air cools down and contracts, warmer air will rush in to fill that space. So all about equalization, pushing that water. So initially you couldn't see it in the video, a little bit of water was pushed out. And then once the pressure changed and became lower, the air moved in and it pushed the water in with it. So that was our experiment from two weeks ago. And right after we spend a little time with the Toucan Rescue Ranch, we I have another experiment lined up here. We'll do it live in my office. Uh, and we will do that together before we wrap up. Now I can see we have the Toucan Rescue Ranch backstage, but before I bring Andrew in with us, I wanna quickly look at our curiosity uh, of the week from last week, brought to us by the folks at the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth in the UK. They had a really cool curiosity for us. So let's take a look at that curiosity and then we'll have a new one uh, to end the event today. So let's get in here jump to a new video and let's take a look at our curiosity from last week. Hello everyone, it is Georgia from the Ocean Conservation Trust and I'm here today to give you the answer to last week's curiosity of the week. So we showed you these artifacts and we asked you to have a think about what they are or what animal they might have come from. And if you said they are a mermaid's purse or an egg case, then well done to you. The name egg case or mermaid's purse comes from the fact that it's kind of like a purse shape, but there's definitely no mummy inside of these. In fact, they used to have baby sharks or rays in them. So this is where some species, they lay their egg cases and the little babies are inside and that's how they develop. So to start with, we've got this really tiny one. This is from a ray, likely to be a blonde ray. Then we have got this one that has a more elongated shape from a cat shark. This massive one is from a flapper skate. And then this really cool one here with a corkscrew, uh, corkscrew shape is from a Port Jackson shark. 
So we are going to tell you loads more about these egg cases next week on the next week's episode of the world's most exciting classroom. So we hope to see you there. All right. So a big shout out to Georgia and the whole crew at the National Marine Aquarium and the Ocean Conservation Trust. Last week, they did an incredible lesson on clownfish and how very different they are from the movie Finding Nemo. They had a great experiment for us, making slime like the clownfish used to protect themselves uh, in their sea and enemy home. So you have one more week to get the, your results into us from making your own slime. Hopefully you try that in your classroom uh, or hopefully you try it um, at home. Now we are going to bring in our guests. We have um, Andrea joining us from the Toucan Rescue Ranch uh, in Costa Rica. They are an amazing facility that for 20 years now have been rescuing and rehabilitating native Costa Rican wildlife. And the best thing about what they do is that whenever possible, the wildlife is released back into the wild. And we learned all about how the sloths go to school. They start off young and learning basic skills and are eventually released uh, back into the wild. So let me bring Andrea in with us live. Hey, Andrea, how are you? Hey, Joe, how are you? Good, good. It's good to see you today. Same. <laughs> How are things in Costa Rica? I know it must be dry season right now. Is that right? It should be dry season, but it's been raining a lot this week. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as of this week, this is actually the first day that we've had sun and blue skies. <laughs> so I'm actually quite excited about that. All right. Well, the clouds clear just for us. That's awesome. That is true. <laughs> um, cool. So... I'm gonna start if you if you're good with that. Go um, yeah. Awesome. So as Joe was saying, we are the Tucan Rescue Ranch, and so uh, we're located here in Costa Rica, and we're both a rescue center and a wildlife sanctuary. And so on the rescue center side, we always try to rescue, rehabilitate, and rewild animals to try to take them back into the wild with, where they belong. But if an animal cannot make it back into the wild, then they stay here on the sanctuary grounds. Um, so I'm actually at the sanctuary. Um, this is where we have all of our permanent resident animals, which means all of those animals that unfortunately were not able to go back into the wild because of different reasons. Um, we started 20 years ago, uh, which is very exciting. And as the name of the rescue says, we actually started with toucans. So our founder, Leslie, um, she came to live to Costa Rica when she was younger, and then she went back home to the States. And uh, when she was older, she came back to um, Costa Rica again. And she started volunteering at this macaw place where they were, of course, helping macaws. Um, and she learned that here in Costa Rica, a lot of people were only helping macaws and parrots. But when it came um, to help toucans, you know, um, not a lot of people wanted to work with toucans because they didn't think they were as popular or as cool as the macaws or that they needed as much help as the macaws. So Leslie decided that she wanted to create her own rescue center um, that would focus on toucans. And so we got to start uh, rescuing toucans back in 2004 and we have never stopped. So I have one of my toucan friends right in front of me. Um, so I'm actually just going to flip my camera so that it faces front. <laughs> so this is Totem. Um, and of course, we're going to start with him because he is super cool. Um, he's a lot of fun as well. And he's usually here on the very front of the enclosure. Now, there are around 40 different species of toucans in the world. Um, for you guys to remember, toucans are only found in Central and South America and in some places on the Caribbean um, as well. Here in Costa Rica, we only have six different species of toucans and hopefully I'm going to be able to show you four of those six species. And I say hopefully because one or two of them are actually very skittish with people and they don't like to spend a lot of time with people. <laughs> um, but Totem here, he does. Now, of course, Totem is 
a rainbow bill toucan or a keel bill toucan. You can clearly see why they're called rainbow bill toucans. And if you see his bill, now that he's showing it to us, you can see that he's got almost all of the colors of the rainbow on his bill. Um, so I see a little bit of blue, green, orange, red, maybe a little bit of pur uh, purple. Um, and as I was saying, most of the colors of the rainbow. We've got two rainbow bill toucans living here with us, um, both Totem and Annabelle, who is in the southern enclosure. You can see her moving and hopping. So both Annabelle and Totem arrived here as full grown adults. Um, it turns out that both of them had a collision against something. So in Annabelle's case, um, she got into a collision with a car which is unfortunately very common with toucans. Um, and so since she had that collision with a car, she has a very bad fractured wing that actually um, prevents her from flying. So she has a fractured le left wing and you can see her, she likes to hop around and she knows how to move around all across her enclosure. If her wing wasn't broken, she would have uh, probably flown uh, from that lower branch to where she is now, but she manages to climb very, very well. And that is one of the very cool characteristics about toucans. They don't fly a lot uh, or very long distances. They prefer to stay on the trees and actually climb from uh, or hop from branch to branch. Um, so that is how they move um, in the wild. So that is a natural behavior. Of course, since she cannot fly, we're gonna put way more branches over here so that she gets to move around all across her enclosure. Then with Totem, we like to joke around his story because um, his story is quite interesting. Um, it turns out that we say Totem was probably looking at his phone while flying um, and he was not paying attention. And so he got into a collision with a tree. Can you imagine a bird colliding and crashing towards a tree? That's just silly. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So we're actually not sure what happened to Totem that made him crash into a tree. Given that he is so friendly with people, as you can see, he's very interested in me and in you guys. We think that maybe he was kept as a pet um, and he was not able to fly very well, and that is why he had that collision against the tree. But he moves around pretty well. He also has a fractured left wing, this side. So you can see that it looks a little bit um, like wonky and floppy, and that is because of his fracture um, that was not able to heal. But he's doing very good. He is an amazing ambassador for his species. And as you can see, he loves to be the spotlight. <laughs> and I see a yellow feather on top of his head. And that is very, very cool. <laughs> is that a new feather? I've never seen that one. So moving on to our next species of toucan, we're actually going to move towards a relative of rainbow bill toucans. We're going to move and see the chestnut mandible toucans. So chestnut mandible toucans like Zuri over here, who does not like me or girls in general. <laughs> so that's why she's trying to fight with me. Um, chestnut mandible toucans are the largest species of toucan we have here in Costa Rica and the second largest species of toucan in the world. And you're not being nice, so I'm not going to show you anymore. And I'm going to see if maybe Tuki wants to come here. Okay. Now, Tuki is nicer than Zuri. <laughs> um, and he's usually a little bit calmer than Zuri. Now, um, as I was saying, these guys are one of the largest species of toucans. They are still both juvenile, so you still cannot see how big they can get. However, if I go and show, for example, Moonshine, who is in the southern enclosure, you may get to see that Moonshine is way bigger than Tuki and Zuri, um, especially his bill. Um, so Tuki and Zuri are both around like two to three years old. So they're still quite young. 
Moonshine here is one of the oldest toucans we have on the property. Um, he might be older than 10 years old. And so he is very mature. <laughs> um, you can see that very big bill. And speaking of their bill, these guys, they get to regulate their body temperature with that bill. So that means that if they are very hot, if it's a very hot day, what they're going to do is that they are going to send most of their blood flow to their bill. They're going to open it up and let the cooler air cool themselves down a little bit. However, if it was too cold like these past days or uh, during the night when they are sleeping, what they're going to do is that they're going to puff their feathers a little bit. They're going to send most of that blood flow to the rest of their bodies and they're going to put their bill underneath their wing. So that way they can be a little bit warmer. Um, another thing that toucans can do with those very long bills, I'm going to go back to Tuki. So maybe he can show us his very beautiful bill. Um, is that these guys can al also help themselves uh, grab fruits um, and insects with those bills. So for example, um, if they want to catch an insect that is inside a hollow cavity on a tree, they can put their bills inside and they can grab those insects. And speaking of their diet, um, toucans are omnivore animals. So that means that they eat basically everything. <laughs> um, most of their diet consists on fruits, but they can also eat many other things such as insects, baby birds, bird's eggs, um, smaller mammals like rodents, for example, squirrels, rats. Sometimes they can eat bats. Um, they can also eat frogs, snakes, lizards, you name it. They can eat a bunch of different things. One of the things that they cannot eat are seeds, um, especially not like very strong seeds um, like macaws would do and parrots. So let's say, um, let's think of an almond seed. Um, if you give an almond seed to a macaw, they are definitely going to destroy it because they have a very big powerful beak however if you give um almond seed to a toucan it's actually not gonna be um it's not gonna get their attention as much because they're not going to be able to break it even though their bill seem super strong and big they're actually very um fragile they are made out of keratin same as our fingernails and so they can break their bills if they do a lot of strength with them. Um, they can also not digest the seeds. So not being able to digest the seeds actually help them be very good seed dispersers. So seed disperser animals, are you going to show us your papaya? Oh, that is a very nice chunk of papaya. <laughs> Are you struggling to eat that papaya? Yeah, that was a very big chunk. Do you want to come here down here? Hmm? <laughs> um, so since they cannot digest the seeds, sometimes they eat smaller berries that have very small seeds. And so they're just going to swallow them. And then whenever they go to the bathroom, they're going to poop out all of the seeds. And then you can see the seeds germinating from their poop, which is always super interesting, um, especially because <laughs> some species of um, plants, they need their seeds to go through the digestive system of some animals for them to be able to germinate. Um, so <laughs> some other animals that are very good seed dispersers are monkeys, um bats are also very good seed dispersers um and almost all of the animals that can eat fruits um and will poop out those seeds are going to be very good at dispersing those seeds now i'm going to try to show you another species of toucan she's very skittish so i'm not sure if she's going to stay here on the front <laughs> so this is um amber Amber is a fiery billed aracari. So, fiery billed aracaris are a medium sized species of toucan. 
these guys are an endemic species. So being an endemic species means that their distribution range where they can be found is very, very limited. Um, so here in Costa Rica, you can only find them or should only find them on the Southern Pacific side of Costa Rica. Um, and also a very small part of Western Panama, um, our neighbor. <laughs> And so if you ever come here to Costa Rica to visit and you go to the Southern Pacific side uh, on the beach, you may get to see these guys in the wild, which is very, very cool. What are you doing? You can see that her colors are not as vibrant or she's not as colorful as the other two kins. Um, and actually that helps them camouflage a lot. Um, and even with the rainbow bill toucans, even though they have those colors, um, especially on their bills, they are going to help them camouflage extremely well. Before I started this session, um, there was a wild visitor, a wild uh, rainbow bill toucan that comes here and visits, but he flew away, so I cannot see him anymore. But he was on a tree. Like he was perfect to show him to you guys because he was blending in so well against uh, the tree and the branches and the leaves. So you could have understood a little bit more how well they can camouflage. Um, and then we have our last species um, that we have here at the ranch and those would be the color Duracaris. You can see that there are some similarities between collar Duracaris and fiery bill Duracaris, especially that these guys, um, they have like the same dot on their chest and almost the same colors. One of the main differences is that these guys uh, don't have those rainbow bills like the, rain like the fiery bill Duracaris. Um, Joe, I don't know if there's any questions or if there's any time for questions. There's always time for questions, Andrea. Thank you so much for showing us the four species. And it, it's a bummer that the wild one flew away. That would have been cool too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope students were paying attention as well because right after we ask a few questions, we're going to do a little Kahoot quiz uh, and see who comes out on top. Um, but to get things started, I've got a question here in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. one, how long can a toucan generally live in the wild? So it's going to depend on the species, but um, the span can be from 10 to maybe 15 years or so. All right. And I imagine in captivity, a little less threats and danger can be even longer. Correct. Um, it could go all the way to 20 years in some species. All right. It's beautiful. Their, their bills, you would think they're so heavy, but they're actually very, very light. It's so cool. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, we have some grade sixes in Linwood, Ontario. I bet you they have a few questions for us. Always. Are we, grade sixes? <laughs> we are doing great. This is so cool. All right, we have, yes, we have at least a few questions. All right. What is your favorite species of toucan? Oh, that's a very hard question. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I've never seen a yellow ear toucanet. It's the only species that I have left to see here in Costa Rica. So I would say it's probably one of my favorites as of now. <laughs> All right, very cool. Let's grab another one of those questions. All right, Levi. How many kinds of toucans are there? Um, so there are around 40 in the world. And here in Costa Rica, we only have six. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. How much does a toucan weigh? How much do, does a toucan what? How much does a toucan weigh? How much does it weigh, Andrea? Oh, weigh. Um, it's not a lot. It's probably about like a kilo or so. Oh, okay. All right. How tall is the largest toucan? Um. So the largest toucan would be a toco toucan, um, and they're not extremely big. They're maybe a little bit bigger than the rainbow bill toucans. Okay, and then, yep, Naomi? Do the toucans have ears? They do have ears. So if Totem likes to see, there you go. Um, if they they have ear holes so they're not gonna be like our ears i don't know if you can see it almost next to his eye 
Um, it looks a little bit blackish. Oh, you can see it a little bit better there, um, like a black spot. That is where their ears are. Thank you, Totem. All right, let's grab one more question from our grade sixes and we'll take a couple from YouTube. Okay, thank you. How big is a token speed? Um, so each individual can have a different size um, bale. Um, so some of them are going to be shorter than others. It also depends on the species. Um, but maybe the longest a bale can get could be around like 50 centimeters or so. All right. Okay. Thank you, grade sixes. You had great questions for both of our guests today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to grab one or two here from YouTube, Andrea, and then we will let you continue with your day. So Sounds good. I've got a question here from Beth in the UK, and she's wondering how many toucans do you have uh, at the ranch right now? Um, so let me count. <laughs> uh, I think we have only here at the headquarters, we have around 12. Um, there's two of those that we're trying to rehabilitate uh, for them to go back into the wild. And yeah. so they're actually on a different enclosure. Uh, they are on these green enclosure over here. Um, and you can watch them live if you want. We have a Toucan TV camera where you can watch uh, the Toucans live every single day. It's a lot of fun. And then I know that at the release site, our other location, we have some juvenile Toucans that we're racing for them to go back into the wild when they're ready. All right. Uh, Miles wants to know, this is a hard question. He's asking how <laughs> many Toucans are there in the world? But maybe we can change it just slightly to, to talk about, are there any species that are maybe endangered in Costa Rica? Um, so... None of them, as, from what I know, is critically endangered. Uh, for sure, they're either vulnerable or endangered. Um, but not. I don't think there's one that is critically endangered. Um, and so, of course, I always say that even... Oh, we lost you for a second, Andrea. Are you still there? Sorry. Yeah, I'm still I'm still here. That's okay. We got gotcha. you. So that's <laughs> that's good to hear that we're obviously keeping an eye on them. Um, but there aren't any critically endangered ones in the country, so that's pretty good. I'm definitely gonna check uh to double check, but I think there's none that is critically endangered. All right. And we'll wrap up before we let you go, Andrea. We have one more mm -hmm. question. Are they threatened at all by like the pet trade because of their beauty? Yes, <laughs> unfortunately they are. Um, so as I was saying, we think that Totem here was kept as a pet, but we're not sure. Uh, we do have some toucans, for example, Zuri, um, Tuki, Moonshine, and most recently Tintam that were kept as pets. So both Zuri and Tuki uh, were kept at a house and then they got confiscated. Um, and that is why they're here now. Then Moonshine, he got saved from the black market trade. Someone was going to sell him to become a pet. Um, and then he got confiscated and came here to live with us. And then our latest rescue and um, most recent permanent resident, Tintam, um, he's another chestnut mandible token. He's on the end. He's kind of skittish right now. Um, he was also saved a couple weeks ago because someone wanted to trade him over for some very bad things. Um, and so uh, the police officers, they rescued Tim Tam and they brought him here. Um, unfortunately, he has a broken wing. So even though he is not very used to being around people, since he's not able to fly, he's going to have to stay here with us. Um, maybe if he didn't have that broken wing, um, we could have rehabilitated him um, and teach and like, yeah, teach him how to be a wild toucan again and put him back in the forest. But unfortunately, that's not going to be the case for him. All right. Well, Andrea, I want to start off with a huge thank you. We love visiting the Toucan Rescue Ranch. You and the whole team do incredible work. 
thank you so much for being with us on a second World's Most Exciting Classroom event to share uh, another side of the conservation work that you do. Of course. Now, as as always, thank you so much for inviting us and for always keeping on uh, uh, kept, keeping us in the loop. <laughs> All right, Andrew. Thank you so much. Enjoy that sun today. Uh, thank you. We'll connect again soon. Yep. See you soon. Bye, right. everyone. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> Okay, well, let's play that Kahoot. I know we've been waiting for it. Uh, let me share my screen here. Let's bring the Kahoot front and center. So our pin number for today is 5061137. But first, you have to go to Kahoot.it. As you can see up at the top, it says join at www.kahoot.it. Then it will ask you for that pin number. And today's pin is 5061137. If you have a device at your desk, you could join that way. If not, your teacher could pop it up at the front of the room uh, and you can shout out your answers to him or her. We have students joining from home. You can use a device like a iPad or a phone to scan that QR code and it'll bring you right in. We are gonna do our experiment and then we will be done for the day. So two more things before we wrap up the world's most exciting classroom today. This is a really cool experiment. Uh, so stick around if you can. It will also be online in the experiment playlist by the end of today as well. So you can check out the experiment there. It looks like students are joining, classes are joining. It's starting to slow down a little bit. So we'll give it maybe another 10 seconds or so, uh, and then we will get it started. I see another question in the chat about toucan bites hurting, and definitely, uh, they definitely don't feel good. Their bills may be light, but they are very strong. Um, and they can be very delicate too, which is pretty cool. You, you might've saw some of them take the fruit and they kind of hold it at the end and they toss it up in the air and they catch it uh, and then they swallow it. Okay, I think we are ready. Let's get this Kahoot started. We're gonna count you in with three seconds and then our first question will come up. So all true and false and multiple choice today. Our first question is, the Jucan Rescue Ranch is located in, was it Ecuador? Is it Chile, is it Costa Rica, or is it Argentina? So you have four options there for the location of the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Was it Ecuador, is it Chile, is it Costa Rica, uh, or is it in fact in Argentina? So this might be a little tricky question because we did bounce around the world a little bit today in our live uh, event, but let's see how we do. We've got a couple more seconds to get your answer locked in. All right, good job crew. Overwhelmingly, we went with Costa Rica. That is absolutely correct. So the snowy possum is in that first spot. We have a true and false coming your way. A toucan's beak is very heavy. Is that true or is that false? A toucan's beak is very heavy. Got a couple more seconds to get that one in. The time for a true and false is a little bit shorter. True or false, a toucan's beak is very heavy. All right, that is absolutely false. Birds are adapted to be light because they need to be able to fly and get into the air. So their bones in many cases are almost hollow. So they're very light and their bills, the toucan's bill has to be light so that they can take off uh, and fly in the air. All right, the cute eagle has snagged that top spot. <clears throat> We've got another question here. How many species of toucans are in Costa Rica? Was it two, four, six, or eight? We know that in the world there's 40, but how many of those can be found in Costa Rica? Two, four, six, or eight? Got three more seconds to get an answer in. All right, it is six, six species of Costa Rica, or sorry, I have two cans in Costa Rica. The cute eagle is holding on to that spot. Two cans are, are they herbivores? So they only eat plants. Are they omnivores? They eat plants and animals. Are they carnivores? They only eat animals. Or are they a frugivore? So they only eat fruit. So what do you think? We've got about 15 seconds to get your answer in. Do they only eat plants as herbivores? Are they omnivores? So plant and animal. Are they carnivores? So they eat just animal meat. Or are they frugivores eating only fruit? Two more seconds. All right, they are omnivores. They eat both plants and animals. They're opportunistic. Cute Eagle is holding on one more true and false before we wrap up our Kahoot. 
All right. Toucans help spread seeds around the forest. Is that true or is that false? Are they seed dispersers? Meaning that after they eat, they help spread seeds around the forest. True or false? All right, that is absolutely true. The seeds that they eat in many cases are not digestible, but as they fly around the forest and they poop out those seeds, uh, they help seeds disperse and grow all throughout the rainforest. So looking at our podium, in third place, we've got the smooth cheetah. In second place, we have the red pigeon. And holding down that top spot, the cute eagle was able to hold on. So if you are the classroom with the cute eagle, you need to send a message to ebtsoyp at gmail.com, ebtsoyp at gmail.com, and we will get your prize to your classroom. So a $50 uh, Amazon voucher. Very, very cool. So to wrap up today, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to do an experiment for today. So I have my second camera set up and we're going to do the experiment live here today. So let's clear that out of the way. There we go. Let's switch to my second camera. We're happy with that too. Uh, and let's get our materials that we need for today's experiment. So pretty easy experiment today, not a lot of materials. You need a jar, so you could use something like this mason jar, which I have used. You might have some um, science equipment. You might have a beaker or something that you can use in your classroom, but I just used a mason jar. And then I filled a little layer of the bottom with baking soda. So I'll just show that up there. So I've got that filled up with baking soda. You can see that there. Not a whole lot, just a little layer on the bottom. Then you're gonna need a little bit of vinegar. So this is just white vinegar. I have it here in this little glass container. So I'm gonna set that here. And then this is where you're gonna need some help. If you do this in the classroom, you'll definitely want your teacher to do it, maybe at the front of the classroom to demonstrate. Or if you're doing it at home, you'll want some help uh, from mom and dad because we need four of these little candles. You might use bigger candles. You might have something in the classroom or at home that you can use. But I have these little tea lights here, so they're not very big. But that's what I'm going to use for today. I am going to use this handy dandy barbecue lighter. And I'm going to light these four candles. So one, two, three, four. Now what I'm going to do today is I'm going to extinguish these candles. I'm not going to touch them. I'm not going to put anything on them. I'm not going to blow on them. But in a moment, like magic, these four candles are going to be extinguished. So to do that, I'm going to take my mason jar and I'm going to pour the vinegar in. Now watch what happens when I pour the vinegar in. We get a nice reaction happening there, fizzing up. Now I'm going to take it and I'm just going to not pour it, but I'm just going to run it over the candles. Nothing's coming out from it. I'm not pouring anything. But look at that. All four candles have extinguished themselves. I didn't blow on them. I didn't touch them. But something happened there, some kind of reaction. So that is your experiment over the next two weeks to try this in the classroom with your teacher or maybe try it at home with mom and dad. You can see the supplies here. We don't need a whole lot of supplies uh, to be able to do this experiment. So I want to see your photos if you try this at home, in the classroom, send them to the classroom at darwin200.com and we'll have some prizes for some classrooms that do send in some photos. So classroom at darwin200.com, give this experiment a try. And if you want, you can add a little note what you think happened. And in two weeks from now, we will explain the results and we will share just what happened in this experiment. So there we go. We're coming to the end of another world's most exciting classroom, but we can't say goodbye quite yet because we need uh, curiosity of the week. We saw the answer to last week's curiosity was the um, shark egg cases or mermaids purses. And we saw those from a few different species. This week's curiosity is something I collected on one of my travels uh, a few years ago. So here it is. We'll get a nice view of it here. And then we'll make our way down. And then we see it there at the very bottom. 
So there we go. That is this week's curiosity. Have a think with your teacher, have a think in the classroom and see if you can find the answer to this week's curiosity of the week. The link is still up there for you, classmadarwin200.com. You have one week to send in your answer for the curiosity of the week. All right, we are gonna wrap up for today. I am going to switch my camera view so I come back in. Thank you so much for being with us today. Our live connection from the ship with Sehi, with Andrea at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. We had our experiment, uh, our Kahoot quiz. It was another jam-packed world's most exciting classroom. But as always, we have to end off by a huge thank you to our sponsors, to our supporters, without whom we would not have been able to do the Darwin 200 expedition uh, or to do the world's most exciting classroom. So let us wrap up for the week. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us. And let us take a look and thank our sponsors. <laughs>